Hi, everyone. Welcome to this webinar of the Outcome Harvesting community. Good to see you all. Before we start, I will just explain about the interpretation to our French speaking participants. Uh, alors, bienvenue aux participa participants francophones. Uh, sur l'écran, vous pouvez voir les instructions pour l'interprétation en français. Alors, dans les commandes de votre réunion, en bas de l'écran, cliquez sur Interprétation. Et puis, vous sélectionnez la langue que vous souhaitez entendre. Alors, c'est l'icône avec le globe. Là. Euh, et si vous voulez entendre uniquement la langue interprétée, cliquez sur « Couper le son de l'original ». So for the English speaking people, um, same thing, you have to choose a language. So if you, in your meeting controls at the bottom of your screen, see the interpretation uh, button, it's, an, it's a globe. You click on that and you select the language you would like to hear. And if you only would like to hear the interpreted language, uh, click the mute original audio. So that's on the uh, practical side. So the instructions are still on there on the screen. So for the new people that have joined us, please look at the instructions for interpretation on your screen. So you have to choose a language, uh, French or English, uh, to be able to follow the webinar. So um, my name is Julius Geers and I'm, uh, I will be your facilitator for today. I'm an independent consultant based in Belgium and I have been working with outcome harvesting since its very beginning. I'm also one of the outcome harvesting community facilitators um, together with Connie Hoyting and Carmen Wilson-Grau, uh, who will now also introduce themselves. Carmen. Hi, everyone. Uh, happy that you've joined us. My name is Carmen Wilson-Grau, as Hula mentioned, one of the outcome harvesting community facilitators, also an independent consultant, and I'm based in Guatemala. Connie. Hello, everybody. I'm Connie Hoyting, based in the Netherlands, joining Carmen and Gude as an outcome harvesting facilitator. And I did the evaluation that we're going to talk about today together with Isabel de Geuze. Okay, great. So uh, this is the first webinar in a new series of webinar that we will have. So from now on, we will have monthly webinars again. Um, and uh, so this webinar today is about evaluating capacity development through outcome harvesting uh, the, and the possibilities and the limits uh, when you do so. It's a case of UNESCO and more specifically uh, IIP or the International Institute for Educational Planning of UNESCO. Uh, we have Anna Haas with us, uh, as well as Helena Bessier, who's, uh, who are program specialists for UNESCO, and Connie Hoyting, as she said, as the evaluator um, for this, this specific case. Okay, Connie, if you can go to the next slide. So to kick off, we would like you to type in the chat what you're curious about today. What would you like to, do, to learn today about evaluating capacity development through outcome harvesting? So just type it in the chat. What are you curious about? What would you like to learn about evaluating capacity development through outcome harvesting? I'm giving you a few seconds to write. So just type it in the chat. What are you curious about? What did you like to learn about evaluating capacity development through outcome harvesting? So there's a few things coming in already. So um, someone saying I'm interested to learn more about how it worked, can work in a multilingual and multicultural environment. Okay. What are the particular challenges when evidence was gathered remotely? Uh, understand evaluation was during the time of COVID. Indeed, there will be particular challenges that will be uh, addressed here. Um, and hi, Barbara is uh, asking what frameworks for analysis you used in relation to the types of capacity changes. Um, okay, also about the tools, tools that were used in the process, um, how we can find out if people have used the training in their jobs when they go back, if it has made a difference to the capacity of the organization and not just the individuals. 
uh, and what ongoing reporting is helpful uh, year to year. Um, and then I'm eager to hear about how you manage the high volumes of individual outcomes that can arise in capacity development programs. Good, very nice question. So let's see. Uh, there's one more coming in on how to substantiate it then as well. Good. Having said that, I think we can kick off. So I'm giving the floor to our speakers now. Anna. Anna, you are muted, I think. Over to me. Hello, everyone. It's I would like to start by thanking the outcome harvesting community for this invitation. It's uh, it's really great to be here. So I will say, uh, next slide, please. I will say just a few words um, about UNESCO IEP. Our mandate is to strengthen the capacity of UN member states' ability to plan and manage their education systems. This means that uh, we, uh, Helen and me, we work with uh, Ministry of Education staff in many countries. And our core mandate is capacity development. That is really our core business. Uh, and this includes individual, organizational, and institutional levels. And uh, over the many years of UNESCO IEP's work on uh, capacity development, it has become overly clear that a training as an isolated intervention does not have much impact in the long run. So uh, for many reasons. And um, so we uh, very much move beyond the individual uh, level to uh, try to influence changes in bureaucratic cultures. Um, so our offer, um, there are kind of three pillars. Uh, one is training. Uh, one is technical cooperation, and the third one is knowledge generation and dissemination. We are about 125 staff uh, across three offices. I'm based, uh, I uh, and Hel Helen, uh, we are based in the Paris, and then we have Buenos Aires and Dakar as offices. And just to flag a few outputs, um, we in over the past year we trained uh, two thousand six hundred and fifty people from ninety seven countries, uh, and uh, had uh, technical cooperation work in sixty five countries, and uh, published a total of one hundred and ten publications. I also would like to end by saying that uh, last week we celebrated our sixty years uh, birthday. <laughs> with a big birthday cake and uh, many ministers of education speaking about how uh, their countries, many in, in sub-Saharan Africa, how uh, the role that IEP has, um, uh, what it has meant for them in actually the creation and state building of, um, of their ministries and the public administrations. So I guess now it's over to Hule. To, to me. Uh, you. Thank you, uh, Anna, for this uh, introduction. It was indeed a pleasure to work with uh, IAP uh, UNESCO. Um, first of all, this evaluation took place in or on Haiti, which definitely is a complex uh, context um, as a country. So we started off in January 21, in the midst of the COVID crisis by saying repeatedly an evaluation in Haiti cannot be done online, as simple as that. And we kept that for a long time. But then there was, despite the next to all the challenges the country already has, there was unrest, increasing unrest because of a planned constitutional reform. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Um, but, and then in July, the president of the country was assassinated followed in August by an earthquake. And amidst of that all, there was a situation of kidnapping. There was, in times, there was a lack of fuel, meaning there's no electricity. 
the internet was poor, went on and off. So that is what we all had to deal with. And actually in July, we had to make the decision. We have to do the Haiti evaluation online and we cannot travel to nor the capital nor into the country to work with the province, provinces. So we worked with, um, with workshops, people uh, going on and off. We could not, uh, not see sometimes people what was difficult for them to follow it, follow the workshops from start to end. And we also realized that out of the 10 departments or provinces, we had four regions that could actually actively participate because of these internet connections likely. The objective of the evaluation was to identify and analyze the contribution of the IAEP project to the relevant results that we observed in Haiti in terms of capacity development at various levels, that is individual, organizational, institutional, to, to support the development of the education sector. The users that we had identified for this evaluation were, um, first of all, the IAEP, both the Haiti team, as well as the management and the monitoring and evaluation unit in the headquarters in Paris. Then, of course, the Ministry of Education itself in Haiti was an important um, user, and the European Union delegation in Haiti, which was the funder of the program. And we had set up a user committee to guide us throughout the evaluation of people from these users. Besides that, we had secondary users, which was more the, the departments themselves, other program staff of IAEP, seeing with the aim of maybe spreading it further. And then there was the, a global group on education, a sectoral group on education in Haiti who could widely, more widely benefit. The evaluation questions that we had identified during the design were which were the new practices that were developed at those three levels um, and new practices could be the use of norms, uh, tools, the processes being participatory or not, and uh, strategic and organizational planning being accepted, adopted by the educational management. Second question was, to what extent do the outcomes correspond with the initial theory of change of the project? And how can that theory of change be adapted? And lastly, the program uh, of the IAP heavily concentrated on the departments. So it was a decentralized focus. And we were very interested to know whether the outcomes confirmed or contested that choice of giving the support at the decentralized level. And if so, why? Um, the method that we used as evaluators was that we started off, and bear in mind, again, this is all online with the difficulties uh, of IT participation. We started off with the design workshop with the user committee in which we uh, identified the evaluation questions and the uses. We had harvesting workshops with staff from the Ministry of Education, from the de several departments. So that was actually an advantage that we directly interacted in the harvesting workshops with the social actors, whereas often uh, an outcome harvest works with staff of the implementing program. But we had directly the social actors in our workshops, but we had to uh, complement that with individual interviews both with Ministry of Education staff in Haiti, as well as with staff from the IAEP, both from Haiti and Paris. After harvesting, we conducted substantiation interviews. We did not do that at all, only online, of course. We informed people by email and a lot of WhatsApp, actually. But the substantiation that we did do was through interviews. And we had to content ourselves with six interviews, whereas we had invited 20 people. The analysis interpretation or the sense making was largely done by us as evaluators, again, for uh, possibilities of working online. But we had one validation workshop with the Ministry of Education staff who were involved in the harvest, in which we, we would have loved to have a more elaborate uh, uh, analysis interpretation with them, but we had to choose for really precision and time sake and the internet quality for, for this way uh, of doing it. Um, I think that's, I want to keep it to that as far as the methodology is concerned and invite Helen 
from the IAP to talk about what it brought. Yeah, okay, so when, when we discuss about uh, uh, the main thing it brought to us, uh, first thing is that we managed through this outcome evaluation to get the identification of outcomes at the organizational level. And, and I'm echoing one of the, of the initial question or, or, or expectation of one participant. Uh, it's very difficult when you implement a capacity development program uh, to be sure that what, uh, how it will be applied at the job level. And actually the evaluation came up with, I, I have several examples. Um, it helped us to identify, for instance, several tools or several practices that we did put in place during the project lifespan, but um, for specific deliverables. And what the, the evaluation brought us is that it identified that those tools or those practice, um, professional practices uh, had become kind of routine practices uh, for the organizational unit. For instance, um, during one uh, hybrid training, we had participants from the same uh, DEO working, uh, having setting up a WhatsApp group for uh, for assessment purpose to have a, the, to work on their group assessments. And during the evaluation, they identify that they use this WhatsApp group for other purpose, for instance, to prepare the school year to exchange information amongst colleagues. So actually they use those tools and they reinvested it in, in their um, daily practice. Um, we had also uh, set up a, a working group to work on, on their annual activity plan that we had to finalize. And actually uh, what came up is that in the end, they, they, they realized the practice was good. And so they reused it uh, to have a kind of regular coordination meetings uh, involving all the department's head uh, within each DEO. So it, it became really a, um, a change at the organizational level. Uh, a second point is that through the, the evaluation, um, we had the confirmation that capacity development is a long-term process. I mean, we, we all more or less have this, uh, this feeling that uh, a project or a program, even uh, a multi-year program is quite short to really have a strong impact at, at the organizational or not even institutional level. Uh, when it comes to capacity development. But uh, something interesting is that we had prior activities uh, under another program and um, in, amongst all the different activities, we had a kind of institutional analysis of the planning function at the central and decentralized level. We had also um, several uh, planners coming from the central and decentralized pla pla uh, level who attended um, in-depth training between six and 14 months uh, with IIEP prior to the beginning of, of this capacity development program. And those planners who had been trained uh, were kind of coaches for their peers uh, during the program. Uh, they were very much involved and um, what it, it, the evaluation showed and really documented how instrumental those activity prior to the program had been, um, had been for, for, uh, for the, the Haiti project evaluated. And a third point uh, was that um, for us, it's, it's really um, a very relevant uh, evaluation methodology for, for our similar programs that we are, we are running. Um, right now, we are um, running um, a similar complex multi-year uh, integrated capacity development program in Madagascar. And uh, when we were setting up the, the m and &E, um, process for the whole project, we discuss with the ministry, we discuss with the donor um, and, and our colleagues in UNESCO. And when sharing the experience, actually everyone agreed it would be very interesting to use the same methodology uh, to assess uh, and to evaluate uh, the current program. So hopefully we will work together again, Connie. <laughs> Great, thanks a lot. 
Um, so um, in a moment, Anna will also explain the, the challenges that were there. But before uh, we go into that, I would like to open the floor for questions. So you can um, just raise your Zoom hand if you have a question or put it in the chat. But of course, we also would love to hear your voices. Uh, so what kind of questions do you have on the presentation? So just raise your Zoom hand or put them in the chat. In the meantime, I can perhaps say something about the question on substantiation yeah. from Nick, which I see here from how do you substantiate? Well, as I said, we did substantiate through interviews or said who to substantiate. The people who had participated in the trainings with the IIAP were largely, not uniquely, but largely were the planners working at that provincial departmental level. But what we did with the substantiation, we were looking for the directors of those educational departments in the provinces to ask their view about how they had seen their planner change their work. And one of the big issues, for example, was to work in a more integrated way to have the different sectors collaborating. So that's certainly something that the director will have a view on. Uh, so that's what we did in a few times. We and was that in group, to... Connie? Because that's also a question here. Was that in a group mm -hmm. discussion? No. Of no, we had individual uh, individual uh, interviews. But one thing that we realized, because it was, as I've been saying, it was difficult and we had all these challenges with internet and, uh, and distance, etc. But we did feel there was at a certain point we arrived at some saturation that we saw that the same things that were being mentioned were came, coming back from different people. So that gave us more also the confidence. Uh, we also looked for, we spoke to somebody from UNICEF, which is also active in, uh, in education, so that we looked at other educational actors. But we would have loved to do a bit more of that, but at least we, we got that, in, yeah, that UNICEF person, uh, as it, like World Bank, as I said, European Union being the donor, getting their perspective. Okay, good. Um, Abu. Abu, you can go ahead and ask your question. Oui, you, yeah. merci beaucoup. Allez, bonjour Connie, bonjour Hélène, Enchanté. bonjour Joël, et bonjour à tous ceux qui sont là. Et merci en tout cas pour ce brillant exposé concernant l'évaluation au niveau de Haïti. Vous avez parlé de collaboration, c'est un aspect très important. Alors, je me demande, est-ce que réellement, Tout a été validé. Est-ce que les informations que vous avez recueillies, tout a été vérifié pour prendre des décisions en termes de, de, de poursuite des actions ou alors en termes de refinancement, si ça essaie de ce contexte Première des choses. Et deuxième des choses, parce que je sais que lors de la conception, vous avez parlé de de, des utilisateurs ou alors et l'utilisation. Alors, qu'est-ce qu'il en est en réalité par rapport à ce programme Merci. Je ne sais pas si la question, les questions sont plus claires pour vous. J'espère que c'est bien compris. For you. Connie, maybe the first one is for you. Uh, yeah, whether we validated everything? No, unfortunately not. Like in outcome harvesting, we always make a select. The validation happens through the, in the substantiation phase. So we made a selection and we always make a selection of a limited number of outcomes to substantiate. So as evaluators, as the outsiders, we make this selection based on criteria that we agree with the users and we selected the most important outcomes. And in some cases we try to merge outcomes together as one package, if it's like one story, we bring them together for substantiation. But that was, that, that was the case here as well. Uh, uh, I remember. So, but as I said, we uh, invited 20 people to substantiate, and we actually, after repeated email, WhatsApp messages, phone call follow up by us and by James in country in Haiti, we managed to get six uh, six interviews. So that was indeed a little disappointed, but also, as I said, we saw this saturation, certain things coming back and back again. So that gave us the confidence um, that the, the data that we did find, that there were solid, uh, solid data. But also, as I said, we got most of the outcomes concerned four departments out of 10 in the countries where uh, IAP worked. So that is 
a huge limitation as well already. Okay. And how many outcomes did you identify during your workshop uh, with the social actors and how many of them have you been able to verify? What have you learned from the outcomes that you could not, from the outcomes that you could not verify? Uh, is, uh, is that to me again? Uh, yeah, I think question? because it's about the substantiation and the how many outcomes have been harvested. Yeah. yeah, we had 41 outcomes that we harvested and we wanted to substantiate half of them and we managed to substantiate six. Okay. And anything you learned from the ones that you could not verify? We used those outcomes, nevertheless. That's that is that is for sure. Yeah, we, we used them. They were not verified, but mind you, those outcomes were formulated by the social actors. It was not IAP itself who formulated it, but it was the social actors. Uh, and it was I I saw a few questions coming by from how on earth so out capacity development is so difficult to measure and to identify. But as Helen said the changes were really very concrete. It was one, um, it was a, I think one of the outcomes that stood out to me is that when the, the earthquake, hap earthquake happened, one or two day days later, people from Port-au-Prince, the capital, came down to the area and the planner could already hand in an overview with data about which schools were, uh, were, uh, were, were, were in trouble and which schools were accessible and not accessible and you know giving direct guidelines on how to how to react and that was by several people was was really really new but it's so from that perspective it's uh, the fact that it was the social actors that uh, that mentioned that or they showed us that they developed an online tool that they are now sharing with the different school directors so they showed it to us online so there were various ways that gave us confidence uh, but there is always a limit to substantiation that is definitely sure okay uh, some questions around uh, harvesting from the social actors i would like to hear more about the mentioned direct access to the social actors versus implementing organization um, how important was this in the process and how did the situation come about was it something that was directly connected to the applied to apply to the online methodology as i understood is that a question for me again? Yeah, I think because it's still about the harvesting uh, from the social actors, although I think uh, Anna could, it's also a design question, right? Going to the social actors. Um, yeah, well, uh, maybe that is for Helena or Anna because IAEP is a relatively small team and there was a few people in the IAEP who worked on, uh, on Haiti. So, and for years in close contact with those social actors, I see Helen nodding. Helen, please go ahead. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, we 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 had we had a, um, several colleagues did intervene in in Haiti, but basically we were on in contact with uh, with social actors over there on a daily basis, or almost. I mean, um, we we were closely we had a, a national coordinator James that uh, Connie mentioned we knew everyone and and we were also uh, especially since uh, during the implementation we had several crises including the COVID um, very very often we were only online with them um, when we couldn't when we couldn't implement an mission any longer um, so actually we developed a we we had several WhatsApp groups, WhatsApp exchanges almost every day. So so this is why we we learned to mute our our WhatsApp uh, during the night due to the time change, <laughs> because otherwise you receive information and, and you exchange even at night. But um, so actually we we were considering each other, um, including with, with uh, the national coaches and and several colleagues in the ministry. We we consider them almost colleagues uh, actually uh, within this kind of project so it's um good okay uh and then a different question uh, i guess Anna or helen you could also answer that in what ways do you think having a solely online evaluation impacted the collected outcomes and results uh, uh it did impact uh the, the collected outcomes um i think that connie mentioned that we had results from uh mostly four 
uh, departments, uh, DEOs. Uh, well, we did we did work with ten of them. Um, I must say that during the program, we, we could see during the implementation of activities that, uh, of course, some some DEOs are are more proactive than others. But um, but basically, um, th there is this issue also of how how familiar and how at his uh, different uh, different participants can be online, but also regarding the internet cuts, the electricity cuts, regions are, are affected very differently. So uh, even people who wanted to participate to, to workshops, and we, we could see it uh, during our, even during our own workshops during, uh, during the project, uh, we can see that they connect, they disconnect, they, they reconnect afterwards. I mean, it's very difficult. So of course, I think it was a limitation. This is why at first we, we were saying, no, no, we need to have yeah. a face-to-face -face evaluation in Haiti because otherwise it's too complicated. But yeah, I think it, it unfortunately, we, we couldn't do more, but. Uh... Okay, great. Um, Carmen, can we do one more question or should we move on? Okay, Barbara, go ahead, ask your question. Oh, thank you so much. Um, this is really fascinating. The question I'd like to ask is about what question, what do you learn about how to frame your questions in order to get back high quality information? And did you find a difference? Was it better doing interviews or better doing the group things? And maybe to be a little bit more specific, was it a kind of entirely open-ended, like what are you doing differently since you've been through our process? Or did you have focused questions in relation to each of the outcomes you were hoping for? So maybe I heard from the responses that you had some quest some of the changes were people continuing with processes you'd started. Others were people using tools. Anyway, is, is, if, if my question's clear, I'll keep quiet. <laughs> Mm, okay. I Go ahead, taking, yeah, thank you, Barbara, and nice to see you as with the others. Um, I tend to think it's a good question. It's been a while, huh? two years, over two years. Um, but I tend to think that the interviews were more, more resourceful than the workshop. With the work, workshops, I agree with Helen completely that we really suffered from having to do it online. R imagine a workshop where people have bad internet connection, they're in the car because they have to either go to their office because that's where it is, usually, or before the curfew, get home, all of that. So it was not so easy, it was very difficult to, to develop um, a relationship with the participants and to get them, but, and to get them really involved. But with those that we did manage through the workshop, we had to continue. We continued over WhatsApp. We did the ping pong through WhatsApp. And then with some people, they gave more and more and more and more. And with others, that was difficult. And this is this is definitely limitation. For me, the fact that we got outcomes only from four departments out of the 10 probably means that we have somewhat a skewed uh, picture of the of the totality. There were a few people I, 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 from the, the names I remember vividly who were really very active, indeed showing us the, you know, the tools that they developed, telling their stories, and others were, were less so. And that's also a question of, of nature and, and personality of how, how, how easily you want to, want to share, uh, share with it. So definitely the workshops in themselves were not, were not really enough. And we did follow up with uh, sometimes also one-on-one -on -one interviews to get the story clear and help formulate the outcome. Because in a way, it was also a little combination with an, an harvesting uh, workshop. And then next to that, there were other people where that did not participate in the workshop, like the, the directors and other people that we just uh, called for interviews uh, at all. And with the interviews, of course, we had much more precise uh, questions out of our desk, uh, desk research that brought us to specific issues and maybe also around one or two outcomes that we had elsewhere already identified. Great. Okay. And meanwhile, Anna has also put the link to the evaluation in the chat, so you can yeah. find it there, two parts of it. Uh, yeah. There are a few more questions, but we're going to park those uh, and move on to looking at the challenges that were there. So I'm handing over to Anna. A pleasure, Mr. Keita. A tout à l'heure. 
Oh, slides. Yeah. Yes, so we will now move over to the more uh, challenging parts. And uh, overall, as you've heard from Helen, uh, evaluating the, the Haiti program with uh, using uh, outcome harvesting was, it was actually a very, very good match because we were able to capture um, in particular uh, effects at the organizational level that we uh, we didn't know about. So that, that was really, really great. Uh, the limits I will share with you, they are mainly linked to the use of outcome harvesting for evaluating training courses, where this focus is on strengthening individual staff capacities. Uh, because um, besides these uh, comprehensive capacity development programs that IEP work with, uh, such as the one in Haiti, really our uh, tradition and core offer is to run uh, quite a large number of training courses each year. And we have tested um, outcome harvesting um, on these courses, uh, standalone training courses as well. And um, most of these training courses, they include uh, participants from many different countries. And we have a couple of very, very uh, useful and well done uh, evaluations. But what we have found is that uh, a key limitation is um, that it has been difficult to determine or, or pin down uh, the contribution of the training course to the reported outcomes. And uh, part of the reason why uh, the determination of the level of uh, IEP's contribution has been difficult is because we, we lack knowledge of the context to be able to assess or, or, um, or really get a good understanding of, um, of the contribution. And we have had uh, several where we, we kind of suspect that the, the, those who have been trained and they want to come back and be trained again for IEP, they tend to uh, rate the contribution uh, very high. Uh, so the picture becomes a bit too rosy. Um, so that is, uh, so this is really the first limitation I would like to highlight that it's been challenging to use outcome harvesting to evaluate standalone training programs uh, with participants from many countries. And I would actually uh, be curious to hear from uh, others in this uh, webinar if you have the same experience or, uh, or a different one. Uh, and if so, what, what did you do differently? Uh, because we have many uh, multi-country training courses. The second limitation has to do with the, the experience that, um, that outcome harvesting has not been very helpful for evaluating pedagogical or learning design aspects of our training courses. Uh, and this was the case in the complex Haiti program where there was a big pillar in, uh, of, of training um, but also with these standalone training courses. And when I say pedagogical issues, it's it has to do with, for example, the choice of uh, pedagogical methods, the relevance of learning, uh, the learning, different learning materials, or uh, the balance between face-to-face -face and online uh, training when we organize blended um, or hybrid training courses. And we have really concluded that to assess those aspects, it is far more straightforward to ask participants a series of questions in a, in a, or do interviews in a very kind of traditional uh, way. Uh, the third and last limitation uh, that we have identified has to do with identifying or assessing attitudinal changes as a result of a training course. And we have several courses that has to do with raising awareness and working with the integration of marginalized groups into planning processes. It can be disability inclusive education, it can be integrating refugees into the 
uh, education system. It can we have a popular course on gender responsive education sector planning, and all these topics, disabilities, uh, all these uh, they uh, they have an element of of um, influencing attitudes as well. Uh, and we have found it challenging to use outcome harvesting to capture uh, that aspect. Uh, so uh, next slide, please. So um, the last slide here is on some to summarize a bit uh, uh, three lessons uh, learned. Uh, and the first one uh, is that uh, our experience is that outcome harvesting is really great uh, for capturing the, the kind of mutually reinforcing or interwoven capacity development results at individual, organizational and institutional and see kind of how they link to each other and, and really builds up to, to a story uh, and something very rich. Um, uh, so that's uh, really our uh, an important and positive uh, lesson. Uh, the second one, uh, when it comes to standalone training courses or programs, outcome harvesting can be useful for some aspects, but it's really not sufficient. We find that to assess such aspects as pedagogical choices and attitudinal changes, we need to complement outcome harvesting with other evaluation methods. And the third lesson has to do with the need for context-specific knowledge when we evaluate multi-country programs. Uh, we otherwise think that it's too challenging to pinpoint UNESCO IP's level of contribution. Uh, so that is a brief summary of, of uh, very rich experiences over the past uh, uh, few years. Okay, thank you so much, Anna. Um, so we would also like to give you the opportunity to discuss about this with each other. So what we're going to do is to put you into breakout groups for 10 minutes um, and to discuss on uh, a question. Connie, if you move to the next slide. So in your group, um, discuss what are your experiences with evaluating capacity development through outcome harvesting? Uh, do you share the same lessons learned as UNESCO IP? Why or why not? Um, so B will put this, see you all back here. Hope you had some good nice. discussion. <laughs> so um, who would like to share a bit of the highlights of what was discussed in, in your group? Anything that stood out? I can share. Yes, go ahead, Barbara. Hi, our group, I think everybody felt the presentation very, very interesting and resonated with our own experience, um, including the ability to harvest both individual and organizational outcomes and not get so caught at the individual level that you don't really look for that for the organizational changes uh, or collective level changes. Um, there was a lot of interest in the question of attitudinal change, and we were lucky to have um, Michelle Garrett with us, who's working on precisely that issue. And she was describing how uh, a couple of people in the group were saying it's very hard to isolate attitudinal change, but for some organizations, they want to know about that. And Michelle was saying, well, what they do is they actually look for it as a component in its own right. They put it into its own column, separate from the behavior change. And that way it builds a kind of muscle to understand the differences between these two things. Um, and then they can also analyze them separately. So that was very interesting. And you can look in the chats. She put the, the draft manual in there for the work that she and a whole group have been working on. Uh, the one question that... I think some of us were clearer on than others. So we had a question about why you couldn't confidently harvest on a contribution when you'd done a training with people from many countries. What was it about the many countries or about the context that made it hard to isolate the nature of your contribution? And, and what was it about outcome harvesting if the implication is there's another better method if so, we were quite keen to know, well, what method have you tried that you feel gives you more on that? Um, 
And if I may, just because I've got the floor, I'm working on exactly this issue with two clients at the moment who run training programs. And one of the things we're looking at is whether we might try to rate the relative importance of different interventions from the experience, of course, so it's self-reported, from the experience of people who've made the change happen as a way of, of unpacking contribution more. Anyway, thank you so much. It was a great conversation. Okay, thanks for sharing that. Barbara, uh, Anna, you want to respond to that about the contribution? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm not sure we have the uh, good uh, alternative, but I think that next time we use outcome harvesting uh, to evaluate a multi-country um, training course, um, in the most recent one, th there were participants from eight countries and we decided to do outcome harvesting in four of them. Next time, I think we will only choose one or two countries and that those who evaluate, uh, the evaluators should know the country context. Uh, uh, so th because then it becomes easier to know what, what other things are going uh, on. Uh, so th that is the context, to understand the context and what other initiatives, because sometimes uh, we really thought that uh, it seemed a bit too much uh, <laughs> what what our eight week course had uh, <laughs> it was too marvelous uh, what it has had influenced um, but it's true that uh, it us using and that we have also thought that we can use um, a rating system um, as well uh, so but to complement it's not an either or to me it's to combine uh, and to use outcome harvesting uh, in a smart way. And uh, next time, I think we will do it in one or two countries instead of uh, too many countries. Okay, great. Thanks for sharing that. Um, so we've come to the end of this webinar. So I'm going to round mm. off uh, here. Um, so if, um, Connie, if you can share the last I'm working slide. working on it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So thanks for all that food for thought and your inputs on that. Um, so uh, as I said, this is the first in a series of webinars. So um, you can find the webinars on our website. Um, we will have another webinar coming up in December. So some of the people who were at AEA will do their presentations uh, in December. So we will announce that date. In January, we, we will have one around uh, OH and uh, artificial intelligence, AI. So the dates will be announced uh, on the website as well as through the community. So you can find the events on our webpage uh, under webinars, uh, where you can also find other events such as trainings also in French. So make sure to check out the website. If you're not signed up to the Ar outcome harvesting community yet, then do sign up for the forum. So thank you all. Good to see you again. Or good to meet new people here. And uh, we see you then for the next webinar.